You're good, Moses. Yeah. Oh, there. Yeah, he's yeah. just getting comfortable. Let me make sure that's. Check, check, check. Say check, check, Eric. Check, check, check. Br- bring you yours, bring, bring yours closer if you can. But I know Moses is the difficulty. He's the problem here, not us. He's check, a, check, check. Perfect. He's yeah. Pretty problem. Yes. Yeah, I think that's good. How's uh, how's the wrong coffee I brought you? Is uh, it good? Oh, it's delicious. Hey, you like it? Yeah. Okay. It's got much more flavor than the other one. Let's tell them about our coffee orders. Because I think it's funny. So, I mean, I think a powerful part of what Eric and I do is that we're a black guy and a white guy doing, like, beautiful art together. And, man, America, like, really needs that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But our coffee drinks are crisscrossed. (laughs) Eric orders a hot white chocolate mocha, and I order an iced dark mocha every time. Every time. And this week, they crisscrossed it. And I'll tell you what, it will make you jump. Jump. <laughs> <laughs> but this this is a white chocolate mocha, and it is sweet, man. Yeah. It is, oh, no wonder you're so kind and gentle and sweet. <laughs> My goodness. It's just like a sugar bomb, you know? <laughs> I have been called that many times. I know. I've been so many people's sugar bomb over the years. Yep. <laughs> For like six months. <laughs> till, till dawn do us part. I can't believe they keep watching this show. <laughs> it's because we don't name them. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they're probably throwing darts at the... <laughs> mm-hmm. That could be, could be true. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't blame them. <laughs> yeah. Someone asked for our autograph the other day. Really? Yeah, but it was my dad, so... <laughs> He, he had, yeah, he has the original poster. He's just proud of his son. That's he, awesome. he has the original poster from when we were going to do, uh, do the, the like, humanist Bible study at the merge. At the merge. And yeah. he wants us to sign it. It's hanging up in his office. We have to do it. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Our, what, our last episode <laughs> said our biggest fans are, number one, Mark's mom, and I guess we'll include dad, and two, Eric's ex-girlfriends. <laughs> and a whole bunch of... Others, I mean, uh, yeah, we see yeah. you joining from all over the world from on our like on our like feed uh, stats, but you know, uh, <laughs> my parents are like you know very close, and Eric's ex girlfriends stay closer than they ought to, and so. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do I have to edit that out? No, I don't know. <laughs> what are we doing today? Oh my gosh! So we covered our coffee. My parents and Eric's uh, dating life, and now yeah. we're ready to roll. I yeah, think. I think okay. so. So today, <laughs> <laughs> this episode's a disaster. It's a disaster. You like that? Like since the beginning of our show, I mean, most of our back catalog isn't even available because I'm neurotic, and mm. whenever we reach like new levels of production, I'm like, oh, the earlier stuff has to go. It has to and go. so like, there's this entire back catalog that I shove off every what year and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you go back to the beginning. Our episodes have like callbacks, like sketch comedy, almost for six years. Like we've really? been saying some things forever. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It's hilarious. Wow. Anyways, yeah. good times. Yeah. One. Good times. Want to do a poem? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yes. This one. Okay, so you ready to rock a poem? Ready. Which one are we doing? I forgot. All right, so this one is called The Tenth Muse. Oh, that's right. And we yeah. already filmed it because it had to be played in the chaos of your <laughs> drum practice room. <laughs> you know? Yeah. With Warner cereal behind us and that that's duck. Right. What's the duck's name? Oh. Uh, <laughs> it has a great name. Quacky Doodle. Quacky Doodle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I liked hearing about the adventures of Quacky Doodle oh. back when you gigged a lot. Oh, yeah. That's, that's fine. Right. Yeah, put him on my drum set. Yeah. 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 He's made his rounds. He has. He's kind of like Howard the Duck. He is. That's right. <laughs> I Quack, forgot about Quacky Howard Doodle. The duck. I think a lot of people have forgotten about Howard the Duck, and I don't know that that's bad. <laughs> but anyways. Yeah, so this poem's called The Tenth Muse. Like the number 10 and then Muse, M-U-S-E. And the muses were the goddesses of like art and theater and techne, that is the sciences, the fields of study, 
they basically inspire human engineer right. ingenuity and creativity yeah. and the goal of the artist was to listen to the muses and then relay the message yeah. to the audience yeah. and there's actually this profound there's actually this like foundational place of poetry in mm-hmm. Greek society which became Greco-Roman society okay. where they believe Homer and Hesiod and like these poets that wrote about the gods and men for the first time yeah. were divine. Okay. Um, in fact, that Jewish literature archetype where Moses goes up the mountain and gets a message from God and brings it down, mm-hmm. it shows up in Greek literature when the poet actually the muses come down from the mountain and give the poet a message and he listens to them and now he has something to say. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But the idea of a divine mountain and a divine being that meets in that vicinity and gives you a word to say is very, very old. But for the Greeks, it was poets. Yeah. In fact, the yeah. art of their language to them showed that it was divine because it was so beautiful. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Pretty cool. So, Mark. Yeah. Is it Mount Parnassus? Yeah, yeah. Mount Parnassus is where the muses lived, yeah. and uh, they would come down the mountain and speak yeah. to the poets. And yeah. it's a region of central Greece around Boeotia, and the muses come to be associated with Boeotia. And right. so that's where the poem starts. It okay. says, Old Boeotia well, that's right. that's gave us starts. nine muses, yeah. right? To inspire story, science, and art. But the tenth muse, Eric, is pain. pain. Is pain. And the poem basically talks about how the most meaningful art actually comes from pain mm. or from suffering. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And in my in my own life, I went through something really hard and really personal before we ever tried to write poetry. In yeah. fact, I didn't ever write poetry until I was really going through something Mm -hmm. and my therapist was telling me to journal and I couldn't do it. Like I would think, (laughs) oh no, Moses. And I would think like, I would think when I was writing my journal, like it was like I was writing a paper for school or a book to be read and I would think like, how will people receive this? Like I couldn't do it. But for some reason when I wrote poetry, it crossed the threshold like into art. Mm -hmm. And so I was like letting my pain out through poetry And that's when I actually started writing poems for Text and Rock. Oh, wow. Do you remember that cool old couple we met at your your gig? Yeah, yeah. Uh, They they asked, like, when we started doing poetry together, Mm -hmm. and I just told them, like, it was after I went through this, like, really hard thing. And all of a sudden, poetry started pouring out of me. Yeah, right. So how often does art actually come from suffering? What mm-hmm. would you say? Like most of the time? I would, don't, yeah. Don't or like you, the best of the times? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. And, and we then tick through a bunch of ancient examples where some of the best literary characters to be captured in art went through something really painful before yeah. they ever did something great. Yeah. Um, and then we ticked through artists in the poem. Like, this is great. Uh Basically, we say that the 10th muse is the one that slid Edgar Allan Poe another drink at the bar as he considered death. That Uh the 10th muse is the one that whispered to Van Gogh to cut off his ear. Or for Emily, that her heart would be despondent so that they can make great poetry, great paintings. And uh, there's this one line that I love that like, his art required worldly scorn and she watched them all suffer so that starry nights might be born. Yeah. Um, that line was about Van Gogh, who I've been slowly reading a biography of Vincent Van Gogh. Really? Yeah. And I didn't he, know that. Well, here's what's happened. Yeah. I've, I've identified with his character so much because he comes from like a pastor's family, but he lived in an age where Pastor isn't the right word, uh, actually. Mm-hmm. Vincent was a pastor for a while in the proper like way that I think you should be. Yeah, like He was a real man of the people who chose to live in poverty with the people he was serving. Mm-hmm. But all of the clergy of the day looked down on it. Like The theologians mm-hmm. and the intellectual thinkers were all working in the church at the time. 
Yeah. And they looked down very much on associating with the poor and the cursed. Mm-hmm. And so Vincent comes from this family of like thinking theologians that want him to master Latin and Greek mm-hmm. and be a high-minded church person. And Vincent can't do it. Yeah. He can't even pass Latin. He can't even pass Greek. And he doesn't care about any of the theological discussions. All he actually wants to do is sneak off and draw. Yeah. And yeah. everyone tells him his art's terrible. Mm-hmm. Like most of his life, he tries to be a pastor. And when he actually takes care of the poor, people basically it's... mock him and shove him out. Mm-hmm. Like the powers that be. Yeah. And so Vincent just decides out of all of his suffering, I only feel good when I draw. Yeah. I only feel good when I'm making mm, sketches. Right. And right. Um, I just resonate with that. There was a season of mm. my life where I actually only felt good when I sat down and wrote a poem. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Do you ever feel like your worries just go away when you play music? Is it like the biggest that's, understatement? That's why I do it. Yeah. It, it yeah. allows me to leave the planet for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. There's so yeah. many times, too, where I catch you and you, that's what you're doing. Just mm-hmm. on your own. No one else is around mm-hmm. to bother you. And you're just like, oh, I'm just playing a little saxophone. Yeah. Or I'm just uh, pounding out some drums. And, yeah. you know. Yeah. You just kind of know that's like your hiding place almost. Yeah. yeah. You know? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So the last, we'll let you see the poem in just a second. But the, <laughs> the last paragraph of this poem is great because we in the modern West always want to personify like the deities like we think about god now some kind of Mm. presence that's everywhere and i think of the tenth muse more like puck from (laughs) from (laughs) From, uh, yeah from uh shakespeare's uh midnight midsummer night's dream yeah yeah. like like the tenth muse comes in and like messes up your world yeah but then quietly says now write how you feel. Now, yeah. now paint what just happened. Now, right. Right? Yeah. And beauty yeah. is born from the cruelty. Mm-hmm. So I wrote, but don't think for a second she ever held compassion watching tragedy overtake their passion. That is up to the artist. And then I explain that that's actually the gift you have on the other side of suffering is to capture it with beauty in a medium. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When we did our first live in our Facebook group, um, did you see how many people joined in when we talked about pain? Yeah. And then pain producing art? Yeah. Right? Yeah. We have some like people in our group, like a core that really have suffered yeah. and have created beauty because of it. And yeah. it, that's really what we want for anyone that comes across this show that you would step into your own story yeah, and right, instead right. of like beating yourself up for mistakes or mm-hmm. beating yourself up for the turns in your path that didn't go right, use them as an engine for your creation yes. and creativity yes. and spin it into beauty. Right. Um, because to me, that's the most divine thing humans can do is to take chaos and create out of it. Yeah. 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 Spin it into gold. Yeah. That's good. I can't say it better. <laughs> well, Puppy Moses is done, so we better is he get on with the show, huh? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We love you, Texan Rockers. Be good to each other. <laughs> yeah, man. That was a fun one. Hey, Eric. Yeah, Mark. I've got a story. You're going to tell it? I think so. I think you should tell it. It's a sad story. Oh, just tell it. All right, all right. Old Boisha gave us nine muses to inspire story, science, and arts. But the tenth muse is pain. And no one talks about the gain that springs forth from a broken heart after the essential ingredient of the arts has been mixed all around with ambition and ability and stirred up with anxiety and fragility because that's right, the tenth muse is pain. And so, while Odysseus voyaged, she gave away his wife. And before Achilles ever ran with the moon, she slayed Patroclus with a knife. While Oedipus the king was blind, she gave the old prophet sight all to orchestrate 
The kind of sheer misery that could give poets their sacred rights. Because that's right, the tenth muse is pain. She lives on, past hero and Homeric verse, to slide Edgar Allen another drink at the bar and remind him that death is inevitable and near, and to send thoughts to push Emily to a heart that beats blood and fear. Oh, and she took Vincent's ear because his art required worldly scorn. She watched them all suffer so that starry nights might be born. That's right. The tenth muse is pain. But don't think for a second that she ever had compassion. Watching tragedy overtake the passion. No, no, that's up to the artist. To sense the presence of the goddess, the never named tenth muse, and use her cruelties as clay, her addictions as paint, her wicked ways as words on a page and make beauty out of the rage. The tenth muse is pain. <laughs> that was a good cut. So we got it? Yeah, let's see it. I think we got it. So, Mark, yeah. is it Mount Parnassus? Yeah, Mount Parnassus is okay. what, not to be confused with psoriasis, is where the. Uh... <laughs> There's a Mount Psoriasis? Oh, okay, start over. <laughs> I'm off the rails today. Parnassus. And Parnassus. We already played the music in the studio because this one had to be played in the chaos of Eric's in the drum room. Chaos, it, yes. You know? Yeah. This one was born in fire. In my own life and in Eric's life, and it had to be played somewhere with you know. Where it's, it's it couldn't be neat and organized no. and well presented. No, uh -uh. you know, not that your space isn't well presented. It's just a it's, it's, it's a little bit artistic it, chaos. It's, you know, it's loud. It's like a, a big bang. It is loud. It's like a bass hit. <laughs> yeah. 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 I would I would I would say like your your practice space has its own bass bass pedal like the yeah. bass hit boom yeah. boom boom, boom. Yeah. it's very centering yeah anyways yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so this one's called the 10th muse the 10th that's the number 10 sorry did you guys hear moses he just like stretched and yawned for 10 seconds <laughs> so the 10th 